So you're literally looking at training dogs to smell diseases. And did anyone think you're crazy about this? Yeah, yeah, I definitely had some naysayers to begin with. Hello, I'm Ken Coles, and welcome to Farming Smarter's podcast. I'm very excited to have Dr. Mike Harding with me today from Alberta Agriculture out of Brooks, Alberta. We've had the pleasure of working with Mike on a lot of different projects over the years, um, but most recently we've had a, a really exciting one where Mike uh, had this crazy premise of, what did you do, Mike? Well, anytime you add puppies to research, it gets fun and exciting. Oh, so. so we're starting a puppy mill now. No. <laughs> We, uh, I, I read some literature that uh, dogs can have the capacity to detect scent of just about anything there is. And we thought maybe it'd be interesting to see if we could turn that toward scouting for crop diseases, especially those that are either difficult to define by their symptoms or that occur underground. We can't see them. So you're literally looking at training dogs to smell diseases and... Did anyone think you're crazy about this? Yeah, yeah, I definitely had some naysayers to begin with. Um, and uh, it's, it's not that crazy because it's not the first time that it's been done. Mm -hmm. And so I had read a little bit of literature where people had trained dogs to detect insect pests in trees uh, or uh, other types of diseases in orchards. But uh, nobody had ever done this with uh, something like clubroot on canola, which is a disease that has all of its symptoms occurring underground. And so the only way we can see them is to destructively sample the roots and look for symptoms on the root tissue. And so the premise behind the project was maybe dogs can see the clubroot with their nose without having to dig up the roots. So this is... Um sort of meant for a general audience. So why, why don't you explain a little bit about uh, club root and why on earth we would ever even want to have dogs to sniff it? Yeah, club root's kind of a big deal. Um, in uh, Alberta and in Western Canada, we grow a lot of canola. It's one of our major field crops. And so, you know, a, a lot of the work that I do as a plant pathologist is to help to minimize or mitigate or even um, uh, get rid of any challenges that uh, affect canola production with respect to diseases on the canola crop. And so we do projects on a number of diseases. Um, and one of the main ones we work with is club root. Now, there's a few reasons why club root's a little bit special. Uh, number one, um, it produces a resting spore that survives in the soil dormant for a decade or two. And so once clubbert uh, becomes established in a field, um, it's almost impossible to get rid of it. <clears throat> uh, the second reason why clubbert is special is that it doesn't just produce a few of those resting spores. It will literally produce up to a billion of them on one canola root. And so it has large numbers of resting spores that it returns to the soil whenever it can infect, and those spores survive such a long time. And that makes it really difficult to manage. Um, and then the third thing that this pathogen has going for it that makes it hard to manage is that it's genetically diverse. So those resting spores that are produced aren't all clones. They're individuals. And so... Uh, when we deploy genetic resistance to, as a tool to try to manage the disease, there are some oddball genotypes in the population that are capable of overcoming the resistance uh, after two or three cycles of canola being produced in that field. So large spore numbers surviving for a long time in the soil and genetic diversity just makes it really, really challenging to manage. And so as a result, prevention and avoidance are two of the best practices. Um, and catching it early can go a long way to help uh, be able to manage the disease in a field. And so that's how the scouting piece and detecting it early comes in. That's where the dogs come in, is that we, one of the things we preach is um, scout your canola crops frequently by pulling up plants at harvest time. 
uh, looking for the disease and try to catch it as early as you can because the earlier you catch it, the easier it will be to manage. And then the second reason is we like to know where it's present so that we can employ biosecurity practices to prevent it from spreading through the movement of contaminated soil. So the earlier we can detect it, the better we can manage it in situ and prevent it from moving to clean fields. And so the better able we are to detect where it's located, the better we are able to do those two things, to manage it in, in where it's present and prevent it from spreading. So we've got this great canola crop. It's kind of a Cinderella crop, we've said, in, in Canada, even invented in Canada. And it has become farmer's number one cash crop. And now we've got this horrible club root disease coming into play. Um, you, you've mentioned that, that it's, it's soil borne, it's uh, difficult to deal with once you have, so prevention is important. What are, uh, you talked a little bit about genetic uh, diversity within the resting spores, and, and you mentioned uh, even breeding to, to have some genetic resistance. What are, what are the current management strategies to, say, control uh, club root before we get into a little more detail on the project. Sure. Uh, really, the the main pillar supporting management of club root is genetic resistance. Okay. And so uh, seed companies and, and breeders, either from universities or seed companies, are able to bring resistant genes into our canola quality lines. And then those lines that have the resistance genes don't get the club root symptoms. So even though the club root is present in the soil, um, the plant has resistance, or uh, I guess another word, it's not true immunity, but it's like immunity to the disease. However, because I mentioned the genetic diversity that exists in the club root populations, we have to be careful how we use that. So we can't just use one tool like resistance because the club root population will shift to those virulent pathotypes after about two or three cycles of the the resistance being deployed. So we have to incorporate things like crop rotation and a minimum of a two-year break. So a two or a three-year break from a susceptible host crop uh, is recommended um, to help uh, prolong the the pathotype shift. Um, And then in addition to that, you also have to control brassica weeds Uh, including volunteer canola. Um, And brassica weeds would include things like wild mustards, flicksweed, shepherd's purse, stinkweed, etc. And then also mustard is a host. And all of the brassica vegetables, cabbage, um, rutabaga, Brussels sprouts, kale, kohlrabi, cauliflower, broccoli, etc. So making sure there's no host there so that the resting spores that are there can... uh, the, the numbers of resting spores in the soil can decline over that two to three year break. So resistance, genetic resistance and crop rotation are the two big ones. But in addition to that, we also encourage people to scout for the disease frequently and early. So um, even if you don't think club root is in your area, it's a good idea to be on the lookout for it and scout for it uh, so that you can catch it early. And then finally, to prevent its spread via preventing the movement of contaminated soil from an infested field to a clean field. And most of the soil that moves around is on equipment, either agricultural equipment or construction equipment. So any, and the amount of soil that's moving is directly related to the amount of risk associated. So, you know, if it's, um, if a duck lands in a field and has a little bit of dirt between its webbed toes, that's going to be a very, very small risk compared to the 400 pounds of soil on a four-wheel drive tractor. So preventing soil from moving from field to field is, is the other uh, recommendation to, to help prevent the spread of the disease. What does club root actually do to the plant and how, how would you scout for it? Good question. So <clears throat> those resting spores that I've been talking about, they survive dormant in the soil and then when Roots, plant roots uh, exude certain chemicals. It kind of wakes them up from their dormancy. And then the re- when the resting spore germinates, it forms uh, what's called a zoospore. And it's called a zoospore because it has a tail, a whip-like tail called a flagellum. And it'll swim chemotactically toward those root signals. And if it finds the root of a host plant, it'll initiate an infection. 
And so it goes in through a root hair and it forms a preliminary feeding structure and then produces a whole bunch more zoospores that swarm the entire root. And eventually it gets inside and forms a major feeding structure called a plasmodium. And uh, the plant <coughs> interprets some of the signals that are given off by the pathogen, um, interprets those cues as a signal to produce more root growth. And so you get these large swellings or club-shaped structures. That's why it's called club root. Instead of a nice skinny root, you get a big fat swelling. And then inside of those swellings, um, the pathogen will produce millions or even up to billions of resting spores. And then when the root decomposes late in the season, those resting spores will be released into the soil. So what the pathogen does to the host plant is it compromises the root's ability to move water and nutrients up. And sometimes you'll see above ground symptoms of that in the form of wilting or flagging or even nutrient deficiencies. Um, but in other cases, the root still seems to function enough that it's hard to detect some of the above ground symptoms. So really the way to know if club root is present is to pull the root up out of the soil or dig it out and examine it for those swellings or tumors or galls or clubs. Those are all the terms we kind of use to describe them. So, so really, when, when we say scouting for club root, we're talking about, you know, uh, sometimes you can look for a, a bad patch with above ground symptoms but even just randomly scouting in the field in places that look healthy is a good idea because sometimes there still can be symptoms on the roots and you don't see anything above ground so if you want to know if club roots there you have to pull the plant up um, and then the last thing I'll mention is if you're looking for club root in a 160 acre field well where do you start because you can't scout a whole field um, the field entrance is a good place to start because that's kind of the bottleneck for soil that might be contaminated with club root spores coming into the farm. And so scouting places like low spots um, where there's lots of water that's necessary for the pathogen to complete its life cycle or at the field entrance or along shelter belts or fence lines where there's um, maybe a little more moisture. These are some of the places we encourage people to scout. Um, but that, that's kind of a synopsis of what the, what the pathogen will, will do to the plant. It sounds pretty horrible. It, it's it, visually <laughs> kind of uh, disturbing to see. Yeah. Those, the galls on the roots is really quite <clears throat> ugly. And, and the effect on canola production, uh, you know, if you just have a small patch of it, it's probably not going to be that big of an economic issue. But if you don't manage it, that small patch will quickly become a 30 acre patch that now you can't grow canola on. And so um, because of how many resting spores it produces and how easily it can be spread through our operations that we have to do on the on the land, it spreads really quick. So it's pretty serious and it's definitely something to be reckoned with. The good news is that we do have the tools to manage it. Um, but one of the weak links was still how hard it is to find it uh, when it occurs underground. And we oftentimes will miss it when we're doing surveys or scouting because we just didn't look maybe at the right spot or at the right route. Well, how many people are going to be out pulling canola plants out? I mean, there's just thousands and thousands of acres and millions and billions of plants out there. How can you possibly scout for this invisible disease. So I guess that's what kind of lend, lends towards um, what you're trying to accomplish with this next project. So maybe uh, if you don't mind, uh, take this sort of horror-like sounding uh, canola film and, and turn it into something a little bit more uh, interesting with, uh, with your idea regarding the dogs. Sure. Um, so I had read a paper where um, some plant pathologists down in Florida had used dogs to detect a disease called laurel wilt in avocado orchards. And so these avocado orchards, um, you can't see any symptoms on the trees, uh, but the, the fungus will be there and it can actually spread to, to neighboring trees before people even know it's there. And so what they like to do is they like to detect it early and then remove the infected trees before it spreads to the entire orchard. And so um, they were losing this battle because they just couldn't detect it quickly enough. And so they wondered if they could get dogs to detect it early. And so they did that and they were relatively successful. 
And so I had read a paper in a scientific journal and thought, oh, that's really interesting. I can think of a few examples of diseases that we might want to try that with, with clubbert being sort of the top one on the list. Um, but then busy with other projects and all the disease surveillance that we do and hadn't really advanced it much. But about six months after that, I got a phone call from a fellow named Mario Bork out of New Brunswick who had actually been reading a blog about uh, dog training. He's a dog trainer. And he'd been reading a blog and had read about this project in Florida. So we, we read about the same project, just that he had seen it on a blog and I had seen it in a scientific journal. And he had called a few pathologists in New Brunswick and they were either disinclined or unable to work with him at the time. But one of them mentioned my name and said, why don't you call Mike Harding? So he did. So it was a cold call. And when he called me, he was interested in working with uh, detection of late blight on potato and tomato. And I said, mm, I'm not really interested in working on that disease because we already have a spore trapping system that does a really good job of alerting our growers to disease risk. But I said, what about club root? And so he went back to the senior trainer and said, do you think we could train dogs to detect club root? And the trainer said, absolutely. What's club root? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they had great confidence that these dogs could do this. And since... Uh, since that initial cold call from Mario, that's what kind of got the ball rolling on this project. I've learned uh, from the trainers that these dogs really do live in a world of scent. Mm -hmm. And they're always detecting things at very, very low levels. Uh, you just have to show them what you want them to alert you to. And so um, we talked with Mario and we came up with a few ideas. And then we needed some funding. And so we went looking at various funding sources, uh, um, mostly those uh, around um, uh, funding canola agronomy type research, and we struck out. And, uh, and then the opportunity came to partner with you guys and at Farming Smarter and go looking for money through CAP, the Canadian Agricultural Partnership uh, Fund within the province of Alberta. And so that's what we did. And uh, we were successful with that proposal, and um, away we went. Well, I have to say that uh, once we were successful, there sure has been a lot of people excited and interested in hearing about uh, well, about the success. So maybe maybe now you can explain uh, what's happened with the project so far. It's been pretty quick, but uh, pretty exciting at the same time. You know, most of the time that I talk to people about plant pathology, <laughs> Their eyes glaze over. <laughs> well, you know, we, we learned a, a few new words from you today, and, and myself included. So I think it's pretty easy to um, kind of get lost in your world because yeah. it's, it's a little bit complicated. There's a different lingo. And, you know, what, what was that? My favorite one that you said there was chemotactical. Oh, chemotactical. Yeah, that's yeah. what made me start thinking about some, <laughs> some crazy horror movie, you know, <laughs> Rambo ish style. So, no, we're, we're super happy to have the opportunity to to work with you on this project. And, you know, my job is, is always to look for, for projects that are going to directly help farmers. And one thing we didn't discuss is that Club Root hasn't really uh, taken a stronghold yet in Southern Alberta. So uh, in some senses, we have uh, the greatest opportunity to benefit from an early detection system. And, and we've got a lot to lose. We want to take care of our industry. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, you know, we... Um, there are some counties where it's really too late to take a, you know, a preventative approach. They have so many fields that are confirmed with club root that it's just a management game. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, in Southern Alberta, we, we really do have a great opportunity and kind of a luxury of learning from what's happened uh, in the black soil zones to the north of us and saying, you know, we don't want that to happen here. What can we do? And this is one of the things is um, the earlier you can detect it, the better able you are at keeping those resting spore populations low. And if you keep them low, then genetic resistance and crop rotation will work. So, so that's, that's the real benefit. Yeah, so it's, it's nice to have a project that um, I can talk to my wife about and she gets interested in, <laughs> and other people as well, because normally my work is quite technical. And... Um, when you tell people that you work with fungi and molds, they tend to be a little maybe grossed out by that. Yeah. Um, but uh, being in the world of microbiology, uh, 
there's not a lot, especially in plant microbiology, there's not a lot of opportunities to sort of have it cross over into something that people can that relate a lot to. Of people can yeah. relate to and be interested in. And this is one of them. So it's been really fun for that reason. Yeah, you just have to go to YouTube and see the dog and cat videos, and they're the most popular. So, I think it goes to say. So, so you sent um, you, you put the we, we got the project rolling, and you and you put um, Bill and Mario to work at training some dogs. Why don't you put it, take us through some of the steps that happened out in New Brunswick? Well, I didn't know these guys, yeah. and so we were taking a bit of a chance. But the way that they spoke to me. Um, uh, over the phone gave me a lot of confidence that we had done well. Uh, and and then after meeting Bill and Mario, um, these are guys that have literally, Bill especially, been around the world doing this for uh, training dogs to detect explosives, whether they're uh, IUDs, landmines, um, explosives in vehicles. They've trained dogs, um, th- they've trained cadaver dogs to assist with search and rescue. Uh, after earthquakes and hurricanes and things. They've trained dogs to detect large sums of money at the border. They've trained all kinds of police detector dogs for drugs and and et cetera. So, I mean, these guys knew what they were doing. And uh, it it only took them a month-ish before they were sending us videos of these dogs in clinical situations. Uh, they could clearly discriminate, you know, where the club root material was, was present. Um, and so that was really exciting and really encouraging. So we were really fortunate that we got connected with, um, you know, two, two top-notch guys. Um, now I'm sure there's lots of other dog trainers that may be interested in something like this. And um, we are in the process of uh, working out some of the um, details, uh, agreement details to send uh target scent material to other dog trainers in Alberta that want to sort of pick up the torch and run with this. Mm -hmm. Um, So we recognize there's lots of other dog trainers capable of doing this, but boy, we were really glad and really pleased with the work that Bill and Mario did. So yeah, it was only about a month um, after they had, well, the first step is identifying candidate dogs. Mm -hmm. And so from what they've told me, they look for high energy, uh, eager to please dogs, the, the kind of dogs that when they see you, they want to jump all over you and run and play and, and you know, play ball, et cetera. And so they, they went out and they need, to, they need to get the, the earlier they can start with the dogs, the better. It is a little harder to teach an older dog new tricks. It's not impossible, but it's a little tougher. So they went on the search. They identified four dogs that they could work with. Um, and, uh, they, they went through their clinical training to, to basically, like I said, the dogs are smelling all this stuff all the time. Anyway, they just taught the dogs how to alert them to when they could smell club root. So is that what you mean by clinical training? Can you maybe just clarify that? Sure. So that would be like training indoors where they have, um, say, uh, a little table with six PVC, six or seven PVC elbows and then they put target scent in one of the six or seven elbows, and then they they condition the dog to they reward the dog to alert them to where clubbert is, either by barking or digging or pushing their nose on it, etc. Mm-hmm. And so in the clinical training, they they showed the dogs that they'd be rewarded for alerting them to when clubbert was present, and then they take them into some other training scenarios where they have boxes of material outside, and they start adding in. Uh, distractor scents and and uh, noises and people and other distractors uh, to help um, train the dogs to stay focused on the job that they're doing and and then the dogs know they get rewarded for doing the job and so you know after a month or two they were sending us videos that indicated that they could certainly do this and and it was time to start getting ready to schedule a a visit to some canola fields. Mm-hmm. We, t- we uh, actually showed some of those videos at some of our events, and it was really cool just to watch the crowd react to the dogs just zeroing in and pinpointing those samples immediately. So um, we even had the chance to show that to our, our egg minister, and, and they were very excited to, to see that. So that's, um, that's some, I think, just like you said, that, that human interest piece to, to see that uh, it's so easy for them to 
to be able to zero in on, on those different scents. So I think once we saw those videos and you as well, I think same thing, we were super excited to see, okay, so they can, they can sniff out a sample in a room. What about real life? So um, I guess we're now down to that part of the story when they got to have a little airplane ride out to Alberta <laughs> and uh, you had a beautiful day planned out and I can't uh, thank you enough for, for having us along. It was a lot of fun. That was a good day. Yeah. But, you know, even in advance of that, after they had done the indoor clinical <clears throat> training, they started taking material outdoors right. and hiding it yeah. and even burying it in the ground. Mm -hmm. And so um, they would take the dogs to a location and, and leave them in their kennels in the truck and they'd bury canisters of the material or hide canisters of the material. And then they would take the dogs out and say, you know, go find it. And... It, I, I learned so much just in the few days that they were here because I was standing beside Bill and he's like he, watching the dog move back and forth. And all of a sudden the dog's posture changed and it's the, you know, the direction its tail was pointed changed and, all, and he started working back and forth across the scent. And so Bill nudged me and he said, look, she's on it. She's got the scent. Um, she's going to find it here in a second. And sure enough, she, she went back and forth across the scent gradient, moving closer and closer, and then there she was barking and digging and had mm -hmm. found it. So they, these guys can see so much about what's going on with the dog just by watching them. So they, they did some of that outdoor stuff, um, quite a bit of it actually, including something that we hadn't anticipated, which was hiding it on uh, farm equipment mm -hmm. and seeing if the dogs could detect club root on equipment. Um, and you know, um, club root galls aren't what get hung up on a cultivator or a cedar. It's usually soil that has the resting spores in it. But you know, this may be something that springboards out of the project that we can talk about later. Um, but yeah, after they'd done all that, we needed to come up with a day and time that they could come out. And it normally would have been in, maybe in August or September that they would have come out, but. Uh, Harvest was kind of late this year, mm -hmm. and, and we wanted to do some work in southern Alberta, but we also wanted to do some work in the black soils. And, you know, harvest was way behind up there. So we were fortunate enough to, um, to be able to get uh, Aaron Van Beers at Leduc County to find us a couple of good fields to work with. So, um, yeah, so once we had that all arranged, that was the next step. Um, of those four dogs, uh, one of them ended up getting pregnant, so she had to go on maternity leave. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then the dog trainers had said, you know, we like to bring two, always bring two dogs, just in case one gets sick or, you know, something happens. We have two dogs to work with. And um, luckily, both dogs did really well while they were here. But yeah, they had their first airplane ride, and they came over and they saw their very first canola fields. And Mario ended up training one of his own dogs. And then it was interesting to hear that that other dog, which, do you remember their names? Oh. Yeah, so Mario's dog's name was Josie. Josie. So, and that was a shepherd, yep. German shepherd. And then uh, there was a golden doodle named Addie, mm -hmm. who I think what you're getting at is they had rescued her. Yeah, that was so cool. Yeah. Because so when we first started the project, we thought, oh, they're going to have to go to the breeders and get these fancy, the expensive dogs. But they got this... Addy out of a out of a shelter. Yeah, and yeah. we were thinking like bloodhounds, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what we had envisioned. But they told us that you know pretty much all dogs can can do this. Yeah. Um, certain dogs have certain uh, I guess advanced abilities uh, for certain types of scent work. But he said you know you could train a Chihuahua just as easy as a gold da uh, a Great Dane to do this. Mm -hmm. He said, but you like to train a dog that's kind of that medium to medium large size. Uh, just so that they can move around in certain conditions, but aren't too big yep. to, to get around. So, so they wanted a, and, and they like athletic dogs. Yeah. And so, yeah, um, Mario already had a dog that was uh, of the right age and had done some scent work previously. And that was Josie. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a real superstar. You could yeah. really tell that she had already had some scent training before because she took to it really quickly. And then Addie was a rescue dog. Uh, it was just too high energy of a dog for, a, you know, a, I guess a, most families. Mm -hmm. she, she just was j jumping on everything and everyone and destroying the house. And, and so the dog had been returned to a, a humane society shelter and, you know, would have been euthanized. Mm. But uh, they, this, this uh, shelter knew Bill 
and called him and said, we've got this dog and it might fit your criteria. Come and have a look. And so Bill said, yeah, this is, this dog will work. So she was a rescue dog and, um, you know, what would have been a euthanized animal is now one of two dogs in the whole world that can detect club root. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And you set them up uh, at your shop and they, they demonstrated the clinical piece. And even though they had just gotten off the plane, they really did just just nail it right right there. That was pretty cool. Yeah, it was cool. And, you yeah. know, to us, we, we thought it was so amazing what they had done. But Bill and Mario were actually really disappointed yeah. in how they performed. And at they the were first nervous spot. too. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, it, but then when we went to Leduc and we saw how much more uh, relaxed they were and how much easier it was for them after they'd kind of gotten used to the new oh, setting. So this and is the my new job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then it was really interesting to watch the dogs kind of get over that nervousness and, and uh, do their detecting work even more quickly than they had done in Brooks. Mm hmm. Yeah, so we had some clinical set up there at Brooks for people to see that. And then we went to a, a small research plot that we had that we knew had a little bit of club root in it. So a very low incidence field where, um, you know, we went digging around and, you know, probably pulled up 100 or 200 plants and didn't find any club root um, and uh, turned the dogs loose in that field. Now, that was the one field they were in that was not swathed. And um, we wanted to try that. That was one of the things we wanted to try. And uh, we learned that it's really probably not very feasible for dogs to scout fields that are still standing. Mm -hmm. It was just too difficult for them. I mean, they looked like kangaroos out there jumping around. And it was, they tired out really quickly. And, and it really uh, made it difficult for them to do their job. Yeah. Um, and so they struggled. And they didn't, they didn't have a lot of success until they brought a canister out with target scent and threw it out into the field. And then the dogs right away found it and started making the connection between the target scent and, oh, this is the crop that, um, you know, this disease will this be This is on. what I'm looking for. Yeah. So then we finally found a couple of root galls and we unearthed them and put them back in the ground so that now the root galls were in disturbed ground. And the dogs were able to then start finding them. So um, the, the, and the way the trainers explained it to me was, um, you know, they're rookies. They've been trained clinically on target scent. But now you have to reward them in the infield situation for making the right decisions. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, it, it's a not. Lot, a lot more distractors there in yes. the field too, I bet. So not yeah. ready that day to go out and start scouting canola fields. But you could certainly see that they had the capacity to do it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the first field, I have to admit, was real disappointing. We didn't really see a lot of their their ability to detect club root in situ or, or club root naturally occurring under the ground. Um, but then uh, the three fields after that, their ability just seemed to go up each time. And uh, and by the end of the field, by the end of the fourth field that in Leduc County, two fields in Newell County and then two fields in Leduc County. By the end of that fourth field, I, I'm pretty sure everyone who was there was convinced that the dogs could certainly do this. Yep. I think the thoughts were now, how are we going to put this to good work? And and I think that they certainly showed that they could um, identify infected plants. In fact, I saw them even pulling some out of the ground, which was, yeah. was very exciting. But so... Um, I know that Bill and Mario were, were very pleased with, with how much they had grown over the span of a day. So I can only imagine with a little more work that uh, they really could, I think, zero, zero in on, on effectively identifying it. And uh, I learned a fair bit on that trip too because, you know, we're in, blessed in southern Alberta without too much club root. But, man, those counties that, uh, that are dealing with it as a, as a major issue – they sure put a lot of effort and resources into scouting it too. Like I learned they, they'll scout every canola field in their entire county. Um, and I, I imagine you're part of that as well. But, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine that every county in that infected area is, is just piling those resources in just within their own county just to make sure that farmers are aware of whether they have it or not and, you know, did some quick number crunching too. Like they're spending... You know, as, as efficient as they are, there's definitely tens of thousands of dollars going into each county's uh, scouting protocols. Yeah. And, you know, each county comes up with their own method of doing that. Yeah. Uh, Leduc County has been very proactive and very thorough in their um, surveillance programs. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, and they've also tied their surveillance program and monitoring program to their policies that they develop. Mm-hmm. And so they've kind of, they've been one of the leaders, I think, as far as, um, uh, you know, club route monitoring and, um, and uh, updating policy to, to, to actually help it to be useful for preventing the spread of the disease. Yeah. So I, c- I could see the counties being interested in having a dog rather yep. than having a whole bunch of people having to physically go out there and pull 100 plants per field idea. And you talked earlier, though, that uh, maybe another next step might be training dogs to, to smell the soil. So um, maybe explain a little bit about that and any potential uh, practical uses for, for the dogs in the future. Yeah. So th- for sure, the most important uh, disease management recommendation that I make that nobody does is equipment sanitization. Mm-hmm. So washing equipment, that I mean, that's a tough thing to do. I right? don't even wash my truck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's hard work. It's messy work. It takes time uh, at a very busy time of the year. Like anytime there's field operations like seeding or spraying or harvesting you got a narrow window to get that done and you can't be stopping Mm -hmm. after every field and taking three or four hours to wash equipment so i Mm -hmm. do i do understand but if we want to get serious about preventing the spread of club root from field to field we have to start using biosecurity and Mm -hmm. sanit equipment sanitization is a key piece to help keeping it move from moving from one place to the other so where this could help out is um you know the ultimate risk averse scenario is where we do the platinum level cleaning on all equipment. So you, you're done in a field, you scrape, you knock off the big clumps, you wash off all the dirt, and then you apply a disinfectant. And you do that every time you exit a field. That's not practical. So we have to think of something else to do. Um, so the the next, the, the, there's a number of other things I won't, that with respect to equipment sanitization that we could talk about, but that's not the focus of this talk. So where the dogs come in is that, you know, if you're moving a piece of equipment from one area of the province to another, or if you're a farmer moving a piece of equipment from one field to another, uh, or if you're, um, you know, an auction mart that moves a lot of equipment around or a, a farm equipment dealership that moves equipment around a lot, um, or if you're a pipeline company or um, a, a utilities uh, corridor, you're, you're putting together things, anything that requires ground disturbance across multiple fields. These are situations where we could potentially move the clubbert pathogen from one to the other. When is it that we need to sanitize? Well, we only need to sanitize equipment when we have clubbert spores on, you know, caught up in the soil on the equipment. Mm-hmm. So if you could, in f- 10 or 15 minutes, just take the dog around to scout the machine and say, here's where the clubbert is, or I don't detect it, it's clean. Um, this could potentially save, you know, hundreds of hours and, and hundreds of thousands of dollars in time and, and effort for sanitizing. Yeah, so only sanitize when you need to. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, it's been uh, a very exciting and interesting project and um, I'm wondering, do you think there's a there's a step two, or do or how do, how does it move forward? Is there a way that we can encourage industry to say take what you've learned and and roll with it? Yeah, you know, I think by involving the ag fieldmen to the extent that we have, um, there are some people interested in taking this to the next level, where they either uh, have their own working dogs or they work with someone to to have dogs that they could contract. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think there, I think there's some of that going on right now. Uh, Hopefully that will snowball. If, if this is something that's going to be useful and it's going to help us manage the disease, then I hope this does snowball and become something that, that people can really use. Um, So I I think the, you know, it's really up to the industry now to take this and run with it. Mm -hmm. Um, But with respect to next projects, um, I do have a few ideas that you and I need to sit down and talk about. You bet. Um, And and really, to me, the primary one is, can the dogs detect the resting spores in soil? Mm -hmm. And then then you potentially use the dogs to really help us break the spread from field to field. Yeah, I know one thing that I noticed even on our our little trip across Alberta, and we didn't even see all of Alberta, but there's sure a lot of canola fields. 
Absolutely. And and being able to, to scout all those fields is just a monumental task. I mean, you'd still even need, you know, herds of dogs to be able to do a proper job on the scouting front. But I think still being able to see that what they can do, there's still, I think, obvious practical applications that could save tons of money. So uh, I'd like to give yourself a pat on the back there for for crazy. Sometimes these crazy ideas can make a big difference. And and I'm really looking forward to seeing if this one grabs hold and, and I and also to work on some future projects. I know we've talked about uh, a fan of my seas that's sort of taken off in southern Alberta where there's weird things going on in, in pea fields and lentil fields that that aren't aren't so hot anymore. And and it's a shame because we we spent all of this time trying to encourage people to grow more pulses and now we've all we already got another uh, pathogen there they're causing problems. So there's never uh, never a dull moment, and I'd like to thank you so much for for thinking of us to be part of the project and for taking the time to explain uh, Club Root and and the dog project, and uh, really look forward to moving on and and doing some more practical work with you in the future. So thank yeah. you so much, and thank you, Ken. Couldn't have done it without you, without your support. So thank you. Our pleasure. See you next time. <laughs>